uh, and this is not the first time that this has happened. You've been asked repeatedly about this, and then you always, you come back and say, "Well, we raised questions with you. We asked the Israelis questions. Have you ever gotten a response to any of those?" We these conversations. I'm not are, asking you for the details. I just want to. Know we have these the response. conversations are private. Yeah. We have raised with the Israelis specific circumstances, and we have. Uh, you have received, gotten answers. Correct. I'm not going to speak to those uh, what, conversations right say, now. In any case, are you aware of that the Israelis say you, we screwed up here? I'm just not going to speak to the private conversations, Matt. Yeah. Seems, you know, it sounds like you haven't had a chance to ask about this one. Are you planning? to ask about this particular instance or no? I'm just not gonna speak to specific diplomatic conversations. What I will just reiterate, Humaira, is that we talk to our Israeli counterparts all the time, regularly, um, from various interlocutors across our government and will continue to do so. And front and center, uh, part of those engagements will continue to be the moral and strategic imperative that our Israeli partners have uh, to minimize the impact on civilians. Good boy! Good boy. You didn't answer any questions. That's what you did. Good boy. You made sure that you defend Israel and you didn't answer the questions from journalists who actually wanted to know what Israel plans to do, what the United States plans to do in conjunction with the war crimes that Israel is committing. Wink and nod, baby. Wink and nod. The genocidal war against Gaza continues by Israel and the death toll rises above 25,000 in the last 100 days. As the more Palestinians flee to safety, the war crimes committed by Israel build up. This is a war crime that is committed in a safe zone. This zone was declared safe by Israel for residents in Gaza to stay in but now it is unsafe because of the violence perpetuated by Israel. Israel was caught in high definition committing a war crime. Now, I can only show certain parts of this video due to YouTube's guidelines, but I'll share as best as what I can. This is gonna be kind of tough, but just letting you guys know, this is deeply important. So I'm gonna share this with you guys really quick. And this is what the people in the outset were actually talking about. And this is why this is so important. All right, so share the screen. And that still seems a long way off. Assessments will be made and investigations will begin into how it was conducted by both sides, Hamas and Israel whether the rules of war were followed. Tonight, News at 10 has evidence of a group of unarmed Palestinians carrying a white flag coming under fire in an area Israeli troops are now trying to capture, having previously declared it a place of safety. One of the group was hit and fatally wounded as our cameraman filmed. The Israel Defence Force has dismissed our evidence. The IDF is not aware of this incident, they told us. But our filming has, however, already raised questions about a possible war crime. What we are about to show is, by its very nature, distressing. This is the edge of the supposedly safe area called Al Mawasi that the Israelis have been encouraging Gazan civilians to flee to. These makeshift homes have been vacated because the war is getting closer. The billowing smoke was evidence of the new Israeli offensive in Khan Yunus that has been forcing more families to evacuate and seek safety elsewhere. No place safety in Gaza. Everywhere you are going, you will find the Israeli uh, army. They are shoot us at home, any building, in the street, everywhere you are, they will give you a chance sometimes, just for five minutes, sometimes, do not give you any chance to take your clothes, to take your children, to take your family and to get out of the building. This is our life in Gaza. It's very difficult. First of all, I want to reflect on 
that piece right there because a lot of people they will dehumanize people who are from gaza people who are palestinian and say well they're just all terrorists put yourselves in the shoes of that gentleman that was just shared, shown when you get to a point of dehumanizing people you don't see them as fully human you don't empathize with people and so just imagine for a second being woken up in the dead of night and told you have five minutes to gather your belongings and your family and leave. How would you fare in that situation? Let's continue. These pictures were filmed by a cameraman working for ITV News in Gaza. As he moved forwards towards the combat zone, he noticed this group of men doing their utmost to appear non-threatening, trying to proceed with care. They wanted to reach two other family members and get them out of harm's way. <laughs> I want you guys to pay attention to this gentleman in the glasses because this, this is very important. So let's continue. So he's trying to get his mother and his brother out, but the Israelis are preventing it. And so remember what I said, they have like five minutes, just five minutes to wake up, grab your things from your family and leave. And so people get separated easily in situations like that. So I think that's really important to take into context. <laughs> The interview complete, our cameraman walked away. And then... So, unfortunately, due to this part, I have to kind of fast forward. The reason being is because the gentleman in glasses that they just interviewed was shot and killed by IOF forces. What you just saw was him minutes before he died. Remember, this is a safe zone. Allegedly. Declared safe by Israel. So, let me fast forward to... Let me see. Uh, wait. Hold on. Oh, come on, Twitter. Sorry. Okay. Tel Aviv. Well, the Israel Defense Forces assessment of our filming was that it had, they claimed, clearly been edited in the first instance. Of course, they have a duty to investigate the incident. Uh, John's been taking. So one of the things I wanted to also bring up was right after he was shot, they took the white flag that they were waving and they placed it on him. The white flag started becoming bloody as they were carrying him away, which is part of um, which they were carrying him away 
so they can get to safety because the Israelis were shooting at them. Um, his wife, who was further along, she ran back as soon as she heard that he got shot. She was screaming and crying, and they were trying to carry him. Then as soon as they got to a safe distance, they tried doing CPR to revive him. They were unsuccessful. He perished. And so this is what happens in safe zones that was declared by Israel. So let's continue the video. Look at it and seeking legal opinion on what it shows, John. Julie, more than 25,000 deaths have been reported in Gaza since the 7th of October, mainly civilians, many women and many children. Israel's critics already say that amounts to a war crime. But now just one more killing, this time beneath the white flag, the international symbol of surrender. Is it enough to reach the same damning judgment? A civil rights lawyer who watched our video says it is compelling evidence. This group of five people are unarmed. They don't have any weapons of any kind. They're waving a white flag. They do not present a threat. So to shoot them without warning, just like that, it's an execution. Now, this is not the first time nor the first war in which the Israeli army has been accused of firing on innocence, carrying a white flag. After an Israeli incursion into Gaza at the end of 2008, human rights groups documented 11 such deaths. A subsequent UN inquiry blamed both sides for human rights abuses. Then two months ago, three Israeli hostages, Alon Shamritz, Yatom Chaim and Samir Talaka, escaped their captors and approached Israeli troops waving a white cloth. All three were shot dead. After that, the army's chief of staff made public a clear message to his troops. Think before pulling the trigger. Now he's telling them that if two Gazans with a white flag come out to surrender, would we shoot at them? Absolutely not, he says. Now, Israel calls its army the most moral on earth, that it does all it can to protect civilians. But lawyers tell us that if that is sincere, it is their legal duty to now investigate. Maybe there are circumstances why this event happened. We don't know. But on the face of it, it seems to be a violation of the responsibility of an occupying force uh, and the, the rules of, of engagement. Now we have to see, will there be an investigation? Separately, of course, Israel is facing a judgment from the International Court of Justice on a charge of genocide. But accusing an army of committing a crime is easy. The actual facts can get lost in the fog of war. Securing a conviction, Julie, that is rare. OK, John, thank you very much indeed for taking us through all of that. Uh, we can return now to John Irvine in Tel Aviv tonight. And John, this incident raises more questions, doesn't it, over how this war is being conducted, especially now with so many deaths? Yes, Julia, I think this chips away at Israel's moral authority and makes it more difficult for Israel's allies to support. Moral authority. You know, it's it's interesting how a lot of times these imperialist countries will call themselves moral. Yet when you look at what's going on with what the United States has done in places like Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, multiple, multiple different countries, it feels like Israel is just following the footsteps of the United States. There are countless, countless uh, recounts of what this moral military has done to civilians, primarily. It's not looking good for them. It's not looking good. Support this campaign. 
add to this the fact that yesterday was Italy, Israel's deadliest day inside Gaza, and you're left with the impression that from the Israeli point of view, this war isn't going terribly well. That's perhaps why divisions are opening up within these, the Israeli war cabinet and between Israel and its most important ally, the United States. Now, the prime minister here, Mr. Netanyahu, is maintaining that he is trying to achieve the twin goals of crushing Hamas and freeing the hostages. He's maintained that that is achievable. But there are those in the war cabinet and in Washington who disagree with him, who say those two goals are incompatible and that the hostages should be prioritized. Mr. Netanyahu is hedging his bets. He's, he maintained tonight that total victory is what he's after. But he also empowered his negotiators to offer Hamas a new truce, a two-month ceasefire in exchange for the release of the remaining hostages. So neg negotiations are continuing, Julie. Uh, mediators from Qatar, Egypt and the United States certainly are not wasting their time. They do not care about the hostages. I can tell you that right now. If they did, this will be going a lot more different than what it is already. The caring about hostages, it's a farce. As these war crimes continue to happen, it is making it much more difficult for the U.S. State Department to justify Israel's actions and making it more difficult for Israel to justify its actions against Palestinians. There are literally innocent people who are trying to get out of harm's way. We're seeing that this is never about protecting innocent lives. This is about extermination and taking the land. When someone's trying to exterminate people, they want one of two outcomes. So either they can die on the land so that it can be taken, or they can flee and be too scared to return the land so that they take the land. This is why Israel wants the Palestinian people to flee to Egypt. Make no mistake. They don't want to, to return even if it's peacefully. Remember the March of Return that happened a few years back when Palestinians were peacefully going to the fence, trying to get access back to the land that was stolen from them? What happened? Israeli defense soldiers pointed at their knees and shot them. Some of those got smoked because they did not want them to return, even though they were doing it via peaceful means. So that's what happens. This is also why Israel is willing to take out their own hostages in situations instead of saving them. This is called the Hannibal Directive. So let's go ahead and take a look at the explanation of the Hannibal Directive, because a lot of people, especially here in the West, they don't hear about things like this. And so once you find out exactly what it is, then you realize, dear God, is this how they feel? So let me share my screen so that you guys can get this. So let me share this. You have been told that Israel wants to save the hostages. Captured on October 7th. But what if you've been lied to? What if Israel's war cabinet 
has no intention of saving them. An investigative journalist made a bombshell discovery. Filmmaker and journalist Dan Cohen acquired secret recordings of the Netanyahu government pressuring Israeli families to sacrifice their children in Gaza in order for the genocide to continue so that Israel can conquer and colonize Gaza for good. Stick around because I'm about to reveal the sickening details of this explosive investigation that confirms Israel's policy of sacrificing their own people. And you'll be surprised to hear that this theory is supported by prominent Israelis and has been reported by Israeli media. Yes, you heard that right, Israeli media. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the controversial Hannibal Directive, which is the Israeli doctrine of killing their own people to prevent the Palestinians from using them as bargaining chips during negotiations and prisoner swaps. The Hannibal Directive is a doctrine of sacrifice named after the Carthaginian general, who was one of the single greatest threats to Rome to ever live. For years, Hannibal delivered blow after humiliating blow to the Roman Empire. And even after the fall of Carthage, Hannibal swore an oath of revenge. So the Romans chased Hannibal across the world, hoping to capture him. But when they got close to doing just that, Hannibal decided he would rather die than allow himself to be captured, and so swallowed a vial of poison that he always kept with him just for such a situation. Israel sees killing its own citizens in much the same way, so as to deny their enemies any leverage during negotiations. Now, why? So here's my thing. How do the families of these hostages feel? How would you feel if that was your family member? If your family member was taken hostage and then your government decided to smoke those hostages, your family members, as a tactic so that they don't have to negotiate. And also, it's not that the people who took your family members as hostages want to get rid of you. Why take hostages then? No, it's because they ultimately just want the land back that was stolen from them. How would you feel? This is interesting because a lot of times people will go, well, we have to go after them because look what they did on October 7th. But people don't want to talk about what happened on October 6th, 5th, 4th, 3rd, and 1st. 2nd and 1st. People don't want to talk about what happened in 2014. What happened in 2008. What happened in 1967. And yet, and yet, people will say, well, October 7th, without looking at everything that Israel did prior to that. Let's continue. While it was speculated by many in the aftermath of October 7th that Israel implemented the Hannibal Directive, it has now become crystal clear, even irrefutable through Israeli media, no less, that Israel had done exactly that. Noel Hannibal, Kanire הופעל באיזשהו שלב, כי ברגע שהבינו שיש חטיפה, אז הם מיד אומרים, חבר'ה, זה, זה חניבל. But what if I told you this mass Hannibal is still happening? That it has been happening every day since October 7th. What if I told you that a major aim of the genocide in Gaza was in fact the continuation of this mass Hannibal? On January 15th, the Palestinians released a video of Israeli hostage Noah Argerman. Noah says that she had been injured in an Israeli airstrike and was trapped under the rubble for two whole days. She also says that two other other Israeli hostages had been killed by Israeli strikes, one buried underneath the rubble and the other in a moving ambulance in Gaza. She implored Netanyahu to stop this madness and bring us home to our families. But these aren't the only Israeli hostages who have been killed or injured. According to Hamas, nearly 60 hostages have been killed by Israeli strikes. You heard that correctly. So. When it comes to people talking about October 7th, 
some of that blame actually falls on whose hands? There's literal footage. I wish I can show it on here. There's literal helicopter footage from the IDF of them shooting their own people. And so while you can say people will want to condemn whatever Hamas did, why are people condemning what Israel did? I think that's important. Because some of those deaths were at the hands of their own government. Several Israeli hostages released by Hamas have described the terror of being held in Gaza, unsure of whether or not they'd be killed by their own government. <laughs> She says, in the end, I will die from Israel's missiles and not from Hamas. When you're scared of your own government more than the people who captured you, you know something's wrong. I'm just saying, right? An Israeli sociologist and military expert, Yagil Levy, told the Israeli newspaper Haaretz that Israel is indeed trying to carry out a mass Hannibal. The government's decision to attack Gaza, despite the presence of hostages in the bombed sites, can be considered an extension of the Hannibal procedure. That is, an attempt to thwart the continuation of the captivity, even at the cost of risking the lives of the hostages. The obvious explanation is that the right perceives the pressure to stop the fighting as endangering the pursuit of victory and revenge in Gaza. And therefore, the lives of the abductees are another reasonable sacrifice that must be made. A reasonable and necessary sacrifice to justify the Gaza genocide. Gilad Shalit was a captured Israeli soldier that the Palestinians traded for over 1,000 Palestinians. In an interview with the Israeli media outlet Shomrim, an unnamed figure who was involved in the Gilad Shalit exchange said that Israel was invoking the Hannibal Directive. He says, Hamas expected this to be a repeat of the Shalit case. They thought that they would kidnap Israelis and that we would cave in. But the state of Israel has implemented the Hannibal Directive on the whole of the Gaza Strip. Now, as you can imagine, the families of the hostages are not happy about this. They want their loved ones to be brought home. They're angry and they have been organizing massive demonstrations, calling on Netanyahu to strike a deal and end the war. To so even the people, even the Israelis are pissed off and saying we need to stop. Isn't that interesting? They're pissed. It's starting to sound like a lot of us here in the United States, when the government does some horrible things abroad and we don't want our young men and women and people to go and fight on behalf of the corporations, doesn't that sound like, doesn't that sound like us? You're going to see a lot of similarities between how we feel in the United States versus how Israelis feel about what's going on and the IDF going to uh, commit genocide in Gaza. Let's continue. Save their loved ones and live up to their promise of bringing them home, which was supposedly a key objective for Israel in this war. And some of the demonstrators are former hostages themselves. And so Netanyahu has been gaslighting the families of these hostages to convince them to sacrifice their own children. 
so that he can achieve his political ambition of conquering Gaza and ethnically cleansing the Palestinians from it. You see, to Netanyahu and his cabinet, the families of the hostages are nothing but an obstacle that stands in the way of Israel's genocide in Gaza. But more importantly to him, they are endangering his political Career. In a private meeting between Netanyahu and the family of the hostages, several far right-wing extremists whose family members were also taken hostage were brought in to try and convince everyone else that their pain should be set aside for the greater interests of the Israeli state. One of these far right-wing extremists, Ohad Zvi Lapidot, addressed the families. This is a secret audio recording of that exchange. So I want you guys to listen closely. And I'm going to be reading what they say because I think this is very important for you guys to see the depravity of some of these Zionists who are willing to sacrifice their own family members just for the expansion of a state that is literally taking the land from an indigenous people. Let's just be real. That's exactly what it is. So, let's go. He said, we are at a historic moment. And in this historic moment, personal pain can't drive Outraged, a mother of one of the hostages responded. She says, first, they need to be freed. That's what needs to be done, nothing else. <laughs> what Lepidot said next set fire to the room. <laughs> he said, there is a prime minister whose job it is to see the whole of Israel in the general role. <laughs> he said, there is a chess game. There are pawns. Let me ask you this. What if your family member was called a pawn? How would you feel about that? Would you just be okay? Would you say, well, okay, you know, in the greater grand scheme of things, my family member's a pawn. Or would you be livid? I would be the latter. She says, but it's not pawns. It's not pawns. It's children. It's old people. It's babies. Civilian population. She says, sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, we are not here for a political discussion. Now, as you can clearly tell, there is division amongst the families. Yet, after the meeting, the far right-wing extremist family members in support of Netanyahu, sacrificing their children for conquest, went outside and spoke directly to the media, pretending to represent all of the families that had met with Netanyahu. <laughs> He basically said, if I had to choose between the love of my family and the love of my nation, I choose my nation. So no matter what your nation does, screw your family? Is that, is that what is that what we're at? Something's not right here. Something's not right. Does that, does that make any sense to you? It's wild, man. Let's continue. <laughs> By dividing the families and using guilt to dissuade them from standing in his way and then lying to both the public and the media, 
Netanyahu seeks to maintain his position that Gaza must be completely wiped off the map. This PSYOP, this lie, this betrayal of the families of the hostages of the Israeli citizenry, who are nothing but pawns to Israeli leadership, is how Netanyahu has been able to convince Israeli society to continue the war. Ever since this PSYOP took place, Netanyahu's war cabinet has implemented a mass Hannibal policy in Gaza wiping out their hostages and removing all obstacles to the ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Palestinian people. In one case, the IDF used poison gas to kill an Israeli hostage, being held in an underground tunnel. In a chilling social media post, the mother of the murdered hostage said her son crushed his fingers trying to dig his way out of the tunnel before choking to death on the poisonous gas. She writes, They're using gas chambers. Anybody noticing a trend? Like the old saying go, his history may not repeat itself, but it damn sure rhymes. Mm-mm-mm. rightly asks, if it were Netanyahu's son being held hostage, would the IDF have acted so recklessly? She went on to say that there is no future for this country after what they did to you. This poor mother raises an important point. What is the point of establishing a safe home for the Jews and expanding your territory through conquest for your own people if you have to murder your own people to achieve it? Uh -huh. That's the question that a lot of people should ask. Why are we willing to sacrifice for the sake of conquest? For the sake of just taking something from somebody else so that you can have it, so that you can extract the resources? And the resources go to whom? Does it actually go to the people or does the resources actually go to the corporations? which are really the ones who actually run the government, right? Like puppet masters. I think that's something that we need to take into consideration here. There is so much more in this bombshell investigation conducted by Dan Cohen, so check out the link to his article. And remember, we all know that the algorithm censors and bans content like this. So I'm going to share... that also into the chat but make no mistake of what's going on is that people say oh we, we just want the hostages released israel doesn't believe in that now the palestinian resistance yes they do <laughs> that's why they took hostages in the first place so they can do an exchange but israel doesn't believe in that because if they did there wouldn't have been as many people that died on October 7th. Those three young men that were waving the white flag, one of them German, wouldn't have been killed. And don't tell me, oh my God, they could have had on suicide vests, blah, blah, blah. No, because they literally took their shirts off to show that they didn't have those. And they were waving white shirts. Basically, a sign of surrender and they were still killed that's what happened because ultimately it is not about saving the lives of civilians this is settler colonialism this is terrorism don't stop talking about the crimes Israel has committed. Do not support anyone that is fine with the 
illegal occupation in place. Now, like I said before, a ceasefire is not good enough. The illegal occupation and apartheid must end. Any candidate that is running for office right now must be on board with the ending of the occupation and apartheid to get my vote. That's nothing less. Like, the ending of the occupation is the floor for me. I hope it's the floor for you too. Because when they say, oh, we just want a ceasefire, no, 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 no. That's not good enough. That doesn't do it for me. Now, there's only a few candidates that actually fit that criteria. And none of them are part of the duopoly. None of them are Democrat or Republican. We have to remember that these people who are saying, even if they say we just need a ceasefire or humanitarian pause, And then what? What's after that? Because I don't see anything else, any other answers from them after that. So let me share this as well. I thought I put it in my notes, but it's all good. A spokesperson was asked about this as well. Actually, let me let me go here first. Because Netanyahu actually rejected a ceasefire. That's right. Rejected one. So I'm going to share my screen really quick because a lot of times people will go, well, we need to exchange hostages. You can't exchange hostages without a ceasefire, but that's the way it goes. So this is from Dan Cohen. If you guys have not, great account to follow, great journalist. He says, one day after Netanyahu rejected a ceasefire, families of captives in Gaza stormed the Knesset, meeting to demand an immediate deal. Quote, you will not sit here while our children die. End quote. The Israeli government is sacrificing its own people. So they're speaking Hebrew. Um, so. So my question to you is, how would you react if you knew that this was happening to your kids, to your loved ones? Some of the ones that were kidnapped we seen were elderly. The video was released a couple months back. What if that was your grandmother? What was that your father, your sister, your sibling? What if that was your spouse? Would you react this way? Would you react the same way? I, I know I would. I do not consent to sacrificing my family just so that you can gain some territory so that you can build the Ben Gurion Canal or you can extract some liquefied natural gas and put some 
pumps off of the coast to extract oil. Like, no. But does this remind you of something? Does this remind you of something? You know what it reminds me of? What was our troops doing in Iraq? What were they doing in Afghanistan? What were they actually there for? Was it just to protect our democracy, to keep us safe? No, absolutely not. You know what our troops were doing there for? To do what the same directive is for police within our borders, to protect capital, to extract resources so that they can have those resources so that they can make more money. This is what the sacrifice is for. So that corporations can continue to make more money, to take more out of the earth, and to own that land. This is what is going on. And so I don't care what anybody says. Your extraction of resources, your ceiling of land does not take precedent over my, my family's life. And that's exactly how some of these Israelis feel. They're not willing to sacrifice that. That's why they were willing to storm the Neset because they said, no, absolutely not. So that was from Dan Cohen. I hope to get him on one day. I would love to be able to get him on. But in the meantime, we have that, which is wonderful from him. So thank you so very much, Dan Cohen, from that for that. I also want to share this as well. Here is proof of what Netanyahu said. Netanyahu's a monster. I'm putting that into the record right now. This man is a monster. Oh, all right. אנחנו ממשיכים במלחמה בכל החזיתות ובכל הגזרות. אנחנו לא נותנים חסינות לאף מחבל. לא בעזה, לא בלבנון, לא בסוריה ולא בשום מקום. מי שמנסה לפגוע בנו, אנחנו פוגעים בו. So here's my thing. If, if you really want to exchange hostages, then you'll do a ceasefire. But if you don't want to do a ceasefire, then that means you don't care about them. Which means that you don't care about the the Palestinians that are actually trying to flee. אנחנו החזרנו עד היום 110 מהחטופים הביתה, אנחנו מחויבים להחזיר את כולם. זהו אחד מיעדי המלחמה, והלחץ הצבאי הוא תנאי הכרחי להשלמתו. אני עובד בעניין הזה סביב השעון, אבל שיהיה ברור. אני דוחה על הסף את תנאי הכניעה של מפלצות החמאס. says Netanyahu said Hamas is demanding Israeli forces withdraw in the release of Palestinians held by Israel in exchange for the remaining hostages. says Netanyahu has also rejected all calls from the U.S. Its closest ally for post war plans that would include a path to Palestinian statehood. So there you go. 
He doesn't want Palestinians to actually have a state. He doesn't believe in a two-state solution. He damn sure doesn't believe in a one-state solution because if they did have a one, a single state, that means that all Palestinians would also have to have equal rights. And Palestinians would literally be the majority. So they don't want that either. So what do they want them to do? You guys remember? And I'm saying this in regards to Zionists. You guys remember the movie Independence Day? Remember when the president was in Area 51 and the alien communicated with him? And he was like, well, maybe we can come to a peace. We can learn to coexist. And what did the alien say? He said, peace, no peace. And he was like, well, what do you, and the president was like, what do you want us to do? I'll let you guys finish. Because I got to be careful here on YouTube. But that's, that's basically what's happening. Because when you've murdered 25,000, 25,000, and then on top of it, you bomb churches, yes, Christians, mosques, hospitals, refugee camps, and residential buildings. When you've done all that, you have basically said that you do not care about the lives of civilians. And you're using the Palestinian resistance as a excuse to get rid, to exterminate the Palestinian people from the region, from their home. So that is how people like Netanyahu actually feel about the people who are in Palestine. It is, it is sad and it is disgusting. especially in regards to what they're doing in, in Palestine. Not to mention they're now trying to attack Iran. The U.S. is literally trying to, not trying, but they are bombing Yemen now. So it's now direct. So let's go to this because the State Department, they were asked about the murder of a civilian that was waving the white flag. And the State Department was like, <laughs> I can't see nothing. The State Department, they were like, well, we don't know. We don't know all the details. Like, the video's right in front of you. The, the State Department literally pulled a John Cena. Can't see me. That's what they did. Let's share this. Yeah, go ahead in the back. Yeah, you may have had the chance to see uh, some of the footage uh, shot by our cameraman in the Gaza Strip, widely shared online, showing a group of men um, waving a white flag, representing no threat whatsoever, unarmed, uh, and moving south uh, to try and reach some relatives. Um, the IDF opened fire, uh, as you can see on that video, and killed one of them, uh, Abu Salul. 
I wonder what your response to that is and whether you think from watching that video, whether that potentially represents a war crime. Um, I have seen those, the, that footage, um, but uh, I uh, am not going to uh, comment on the specifics around that, given I'm not aware of the full circumstances on the ground. Uh, and as we've said before, this is not um, an American operation. But well, beyond true, but never, that, yeah, please you're, note, you're, you're I, I'm happy to take... Wait, 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 one second. So if China had did this, if Russia had did this, if DPRK, Cuba, Venezuela, you guys would say that's a war crime. You guys would have answered that question clearly. Clearly. By the way, it's funny when now you see all these people who are the spokespeople for the State Department and the Pentagon and all that. A lot of them are now brown. Interesting how they put these people, brown people in these positions now. But anyways, they would have called that out immediately. But because it's Israel, we can't, we can't discuss it. It wasn't U.S. forces, so we really don't want to get into it. Sorry, but eh, yes, I've seen it, but I don't, I don't know the entire situation. It's right in front of your eyes. This is blatant disregard for life. Blatant disregard. If your questions, if you'll allow me, I, if you allow me to, to answer, I don't interrupt you. I ask you to not do the same. Um, as a general matter, though, we have not parsed our words about the moral and strategic imperative that the government of Israel and the Israeli security forces have to take every effort possible to minimize civilian casualties and minimize impact on civilians. But they're literally taking out, smoking their own people that are held hostage. Literally, like, what is this guy saying? They're not doing that. Why do you hell you think there are thousands upon thousands of people in the streets right now that are literally protesting? They don't actually care. Good God, good golly, Miss Molly, man. As it relates to the footage that your organization ha has shared, again, I'm just going to refrain from commenting on specific operations as we do not have full circumstances of what on the ground from here. This isn't an American uh, operation. I'm not on the ground there to speak to the uh, full parameters of the situation. Hold up. Wait a minute. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of when there's body cam footage or somebody takes cell phone video of the police committing brutality against a citizen. And then the people who are in charge go, well, I don't know the entire situation. We have to conduct an investigation, even though it's right in front of you. We don't know the entire context. They were literally waving a white flag and unarmed with their hands in the air. That's a war crime. And yet, you're like, well, I don't know. Mm -mm. Don't get me started. It's but not, again, it's not, it's not any right. civilian death uh, any civilian death is is heartbreaking, and any uh, civilian life lost uh, is is one too many. And we have made that clear uh, with the Israelis, and we'll continue to do so. Beyond that comment about it being heartbreaking, which is a platitude we often hear, um, are you? Would you urge, uh, given that you, you support broadly support IDF operations in the Gaza Strip, would you support a Israeli investigation of what happened in that video? That given, is for given that they're waving a white flag and that, they represented no threat. That, that is for uh, the IDF to to undertake and determine uh, based on the circumstances of that uh, situation. What I he only asked if you support that. He didn't. Ask oh my God, these people! I will say is that we have 
been clear to uh, our Israeli partners that they need to take every possible measure to avoid civilian harm during an operation and investigate credible allegations of, uh, uh, of law or of war violations when they arise. Just because you say it doesn't mean that it actually will get done, number one. Number two, you could be just giving them a wink and a nod. It's just like, it's just like if chopping a tree was illegal and you secretly supported it, but you have to make it look like you're not in support of it. So it's just like, yeah, stop chopping that tree. You know what I mean? It's not right. Oh my goodness. Oh no. Stop chopping the tree. It's damaging to the environment. Don't you know that? That's what it feels like to me what's going on, right? Am I crazy? Am I am I out of my mind right now? Because that's what it feels like to me. Put in the comments if you, if, if you think, you know, either I'm crazy or if you think I'm right on point. Because that's what it seems like to me. That is for um, uh, our Israeli partners in the IDF to speak to. Just on this. Uh, yeah. that we don't have the full facts or something like that in, in, in a minute. Like, did you did you actually reach out specifically to Israel about this footage and try to get whatever the facts that I, you guys are seeking? This footage just arised uh, earlier this morning, so I don't have any specifics of uh, of our diplomatic conversations okay. around it, around this to right. speak well, to. How about the footage that arose last week and the week before and the week before and the week before and the week before? where there have been, you know, if not similar, awfully close instances. Have you ever gotten a, an explanation from the Israelis? I'm, have you ever gotten a finding from the Israelis of what their investigation, if they promised one? I, I'm not going to speak to uh, private diplomatic conversations, Matt, but this is something that uh, we raise continuously with the Israelis. Uh, the secretary has done so, other officials. In How many times are you going to keep raising this before you actually realize that they actually just don't care? Oh, we raised our concerns. That doesn't do crap. That doesn't do crap. Like, no. You don't just raise them. Honestly, these are sanctionable offenses. That's what it looks like to me. These are offenses that are like, nah, bro, you, you guys need to be sanctioned for all the war crimes you guys are committing. If China did this, there would be special reports all over the corporate media about this. And yet, Nothing. And, uh, our government have done so and will continue to uh, to do it. Okay, well, uh, have you ever gotten an answer from the Israelis? I, I'm just not going to I'm not going to speak to the, the privacy of certain diplomatic conversations, Matt. But we have been clear that there is a moral and strategic imperative to take as many steps as well, possible that's, to that's minimize civilian that's, casualties. That's fine. That's fine that you say that, but then when you are asked specific questions like this relating to specific footage, uh, and this is not the first time that this has happened, you've been asked repeatedly about this, and then you always, you come back and say, well, we raised questions with you, we asked the Israelis questions. Have you ever gotten a response to any of those? We these conversations. I'm not are, asking you for the details. I just want to. Know we have these the details. conversations are private. We have raised with the Israelis specific circumstances, and we have uh, you received have answers. Correct. I'm not going to speak to those uh, what, conversations what right say, now. In any case, are you aware of the Israelis say we screwed up here? I'm just not going to speak to the private conversations, Matt. Yeah. Since you, know, you know, it sounds like you haven't had a chance to ask about this one. Are you planning? To ask about this particular instance or no? I'm just not going to speak to specific diplomatic conversations. What I will just reiterate, Humaira, is that we talk to our Israeli counterparts all the time, regularly, um, from various interlocutors across our government, and we'll continue to do so. And 
front and center. Uh, part of those engagements will continue to be the moral and strategic imperative that our Israeli partners have uh, to minimize the impact on civilians. Good boy. Good boy. You didn't answer any questions. That's what you did. Good boy. You made sure that you defend Israel and you didn't answer the questions from journalists who actually wanted to know what Israel plans to do, what the United States plans to do in conjunction with the war crimes that Israel is committing. Wink and nod, baby. Wink and nod. When it comes to what has been done, it is clear that these war crimes are going to continue. Because when you have the United States behind your back, you feel emboldened to do whatever you want to do in order to pursue this atrocity that you're committing. And so this is why it's so important that we do not stop when it comes to pointing out the atrocities that's happening on the ground in Gaza. Don't stop speaking about it. And always relate it back to how it affects us even here at home. So that's what's going on right now. Stay tuned, folks. I got more to talk about. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. More head kisses and have a beautiful day.